Good afternoon and welcome to this press conference from the 48th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum here in Davos. Thank you for those of you in the room who made it through the snow to be with us and uh, much easier for those of you who are on our live stream, uh, but still thank you for watching. This press conference is dedicated to the launch of the first ever antimicrobial resistance benchmark. And uh, we will hear what that means and what the results are in a minute. But first of all, let me introduce the wonderful panel we have here today to speak about that topic. On my immediate left, we're uh, joined by Jay Ear. She's the executive director of, Access, uh, of the Access to Medicine Foundation. We have Paul Stoffels, who's the executive vice president, but more importantly, the chief scientific officer of Johnson & Johnson. To, him, to his immediate left, we're joined by uh, Professor Jeremy Farrar, who's the director of the Wellcome Trust. And all the way down on the other side of the panel, uh, we're pleased to be joined by Julian Braithwaite, who is the ambassador and permanent representative to the UK mission to the N and other international organizations in Geneva, so to speak, a neighbor of the World Economic Forum. Uh, welcome to all of you and, uh, and thank you for being here. Jay, let's, let's kick things off right with you. Um, the first ever antimicrobial resistance benchmark. Tell our audience here, but tell also our live stream audience, what does that mean and what are the key findings of that benchmark, please? Sure, great. Um, so thank you again for everyone who's joining us today. Uh, I know there's a lot of exciting things going on uh, around Davos, so I really appreciate that you spend the time talking about this very important topic. I'm Jay, I uh, run the Access to Medicine Foundation. I'm gonna take you through uh, a couple of key results coming from the uh, AMR, first ever AMR benchmark. So it's the first independent analysis of what the most active players in the pharmaceutical sector are doing to slow the emergence of drug resistance. My research team and I have been looking at the big pharmaceutical companies, uh, biotechnology companies, manufacturers of generic medicines, and they are the biggest players when it comes to the volume of antibiotics being produced. Um, now we all know that the problem of superbugs or antimicrobial resistance um, is high on the international agenda. It has been discussed right here in Davos uh, two years ago, um, and it has also been in the G20, uh, the World Health Assembly, and the UN General Assembly. Uh, there is a growing recognition that we need to do something about uh, this particular threat. So the benchmark is basically a series of evaluations uh, at the foundation. What we do is um, we are supported by the, uh, as a foundation, we're supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the UK and the Dutch government. And this particular benchmark is supported by the UK's Department for International Development and the Dutch Ministry of Health, Welfare and Sports. So um, the main reason that we are working on a benchmark is we're trying to first clarify the role of the pharmaceutical industry on what is expected from them uh, in terms of tackling this, this important threat. Uh, the second thing that we do is we transform that expectation that we derive from various different experts into metrics. And we use that metrics to analyze uh, company behavior, company actions and activity into uh, translating it into uh, how they act on this particular threat. So uh, what we reasonably expect from the industry is um, that uh, apart from developing new medicine and vaccines, we also expect them to manufacture antibiotics responsibly so that their factory wastewater doesn't release antibiotics into the environment. Um, and we also expect these uh, products to be marketed and promoted very carefully so to make them available without encouraging doctors and patients to overuse or misuse them. So how are they doing? Who are the leaders? The uh, news release that many of you have access to outlines the benchmark's four key findings and how the companies are performing. But in general, we found more evidence of uh, action against drug resistance than certainly others uh, many experts have expected. Um, G GSK and Johnson & Johnson provided the most evidence of uh, the most activity in the broadest range of areas that we measured compared to the other big pharmaceutical companies, and that's why they lead the group of uh, companies. And we're about to hear from uh, Paul in a few minutes. Among the generic companies, Mylan, Cipla, and Fresenius Carby are doing the most, uh, again, uh, in terms of various different actions to control antibiotic use. And Entasis, a US-based uh, biotechnology company, leads the biotechnology industry. When we look at the three, uh, four areas that we um, have been focusing our attention on, research and development, we found that new medicines and vaccines are in the pipeline, and more than half of the pipeline um, of anti-infectives target some of the most toughest pathogens to treat. That include gonorrhea, tuberculosis, E. coli, salmonella, the plague, all diseases that are becoming untreatable. So companies are putting their R&D efforts in the right direction. There are 28 antibiotics in clinical testing that target tough pathogens. Only nine of them are, are truly novel. 
And this may sound like a lot, but it's not enough to replace the medicines that, we're, that are losing their effectiveness. Drug development has a high failure rate, as many of you are aware of, and to be safe, we need far more in the pipeline, and we appreciate organizations like the Wellcome Trust um, and uh, the UK government in supporting more action in drug development and AMR from various different parties. What's surprising to us is that companies are taking actions that at first glance seem to be uh, running counterintuitive uh, to their interests. For example, there's a core group of companies who are changing the way that they encourage sales, um, as their sales staff to perform. So instead of setting reward uh, of sales staff uh, to sell more antibiotics, these companies reward staff on their technical knowledge at service level. And by decoupling bonuses from sales volume, companies are reducing the chance that antibiotics will be oversold. We also see companies are managing uh, to balance the need between making antibiotics accessible while ensuring that they can be used sparingly. This is particularly important in poorer countries without health systems that can control um, access to antibiotics. For example, there's a new breakthrough medicine for multidrug resistant tuberculosis from Johnson & Johnson that I think Paul will speak about that has been brought to uh, patients in a way that enables yet tightly manages access to medicine. And uh, what should happen next? It depends on the company in question. Their business models are very different, and this is a very challenging market commercially, scientifically, and also in terms of regulatory barriers. I would say that all companies must look very carefully at what antimicrobials they, are, they market, how they're selling them, and the industry, of course, uh, along with governments, need a new mindset to see how they can manage uh, products to make sure they continue working for as long as possible. I want to make one last point, given all the talk about controlling antibiotics, about the importance of access. People living in poorer countries um, are usually at the front line of AMR. They generally uh, lack reliable access to antibiotics when they need them, and they also have uh, poor healthcare advice. And, and that way they face higher levels of, of resistance and also higher, higher morbidity and mortality due to infectious diseases. Um, many of the factors that uh, play in, in, in certain countries prompt people to use antibiotics that usually end up encouraging resistance rather than discouraging resistance itself. So to put it very simply, the most important thing that we need now is for multi-stakeholders to act. I think Davos is an important platform where political leaders, uh, global health leaders, industry leaders, uh, intellectual leaders uh, come together and talk about important issues like, this, uh, like AMR. And what we need is, um, while the econ economics are complex, we need, to know, we need more uh, industry members, new, more pharmaceutical companies to develop new antibiotics, uh, new medicines, new vaccines to replace the ones that no longer work and find new responsible ways to produce them and get them to the patient. Um, we'll be tracking the industry again. The next benchmark will be published in two years, and we'll be refining the metrics, um, raising the bar, and looking to see what people will be doing in the next couple of years on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Paul, let's, let's come to you. Um, Jay mentioned that you participated uh, broadly in, in this benchmark. Uh, why do you think it's important, and, and what drove you to, to that participation? Well, Jay, thank you for your summary. Um, why it is important is that on the one hand, it is looking at industry on what they do well and what can do we do better. At the same time, it puts a highlight on the challenge of developing this type of medicines. It's a very long story to, from discovery to development to implementing and, and uh, with, uh, with a lot of challenges throughout the, uh, the pipeline to get there. And so I'm very pleased that the AMR benchmark shows that it can be do it can it is doable to do it and it's work across civil society governments donors and industry to in the end make new medicines for um, for AMR and AMR is a disaster waiting to happen we have seen uh, we have seen it evolving over the last few years we particularly in, in TB and in XDR and multidrug resistant TB as we are working in this space is just amazing on on the on the increase and how how we will have to handle in order to uh, to make sure we get it under control we as an industry, and particularly we as a company, uh, Johnson & Johnson, we have a long-standing commitment to making anti, um, uh, antivirals, antibiotics. Uh, we are working on vaccines and now on a TB drug. Uh, we are there for 50 years and doing more. Um, but at the same time, um, it, uh, when you develop a drug, like Jay was saying, where you have a very limited ultimate pop population who is going to use it, who are you protected for that population, the challenge is on how can you get it developed and, uh, and, and implemented correctly. And I'm very proud that, uh, that what we have done with uh, Zirturo, a new drug for XDR and MDRTB, is that, um, is that it can be used as an example on, on how you can do it. First of all, um, 
It was developed only in XDRTB to start with. Now it's expanding to MDRTB. We, uh, we start the first publication on it was 2004 when we discovered the medicine. From then to now, it's now uh, 13 years later. Uh, first, it took us almost nine years to develop, and now we are implementing it country by country. 80% of XDRTB is in, eight, is in four countries, mainly Russia, China, India, and South Africa. And in each of these countries, and all over the world actually, but specifically there, we are implementing and only to those patients who need it. So you, we limit it to distribution to the government, we train the institutions using it, we make sure that the, com com the, the complementary medicines are available, and with that we have very strong guidelines on how people can get access to it, yes or no. Much often to the, the disappointment of broader hospitals who, who want to get simple access to it, but if we don't use it in that way, the drug can, in the, in, can induce resistance and therefore be unusual, uh, un, unuseful in the, in the next few years. Um, Zirturo, um, the incentive for Zirturo to a certain extent worked. We had an accelerated review voucher, but as we applied a tiered uh, pricing to Zirturo, 30,000 in the US, 3,000 in, in the developing uh, emerging countries like Russia, 900 in the developing countries with 40,000 patients treated, it's absolutely not a viable business model. But still, the combination of the, the, the access of patients with an incentive of an accelerated review voucher made us doing it, and, and, and I think it's, uh, it's uh, absolutely, from a human perspective, the right thing to do. Today, 40,000 patients who, who had a very high risk of dying were able to get the access to the drugs, and the mortality drastically reduced in those patients. Bring us to the point now that we will develop another two or three new mechanism of action for TB to get to fully new regimens and hopefully to short and, and very effective regimens. What it also does to get to new drugs, it also pr protects the healthcare workers. XDRTB is a very dangerous disease where you typically need three to six months isolation in the various challenging circumstances. I may step in for the benefit of our live stream audience. We're talking about various uh, forms of tuberculosis, tuberculosis here, just yes. to make uh, to, to make very clear for you how important uh, uh, yeah. th this work is, Sorry. because not everybody might be familiar yeah. with the abbreviation. Sorry, XDRTB is is a type of tuberculosis which is resistant to almost every drug, and is very difficult to treat. And therefore, people, if it is transmitted, you are untreatable, and therefore people are in isolation for three to six months. By shortening isolation and curing more people, the risk for the healthcare population healthcare uh, uh, workers um, it uses but we can do better so we have to have uh, two or three new new um, regimens needed for TB and um, we'll, uh, we are working on that but as a conclusion what's important to have new AMR we need to build a sustainable ecosystem between the academic discovery the in the, the institutions who do and who sponsor research the industry the regulators and the implementers and that all has to work together in a collaborative way in order to bring the medicines bring them to patients to the right patients but then also for us as an industry you have to do this in a pro for profit system we will have to work together on what are the incentives for more companies to step in in order to make new antimicrobials um, and N new antimicrobial drugs for uh, this uh, spectacular challenge in the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul. And Jeremy, your work with the Welcome, uh, with the Welcome Trust, um, you're working very closely with the private sector as well and with pharmaceutical companies. So from your perspective, and I know and those of you who've been watching for a couple of years, you know that Jeremy comes back every year and says, indeed, this is a disaster waiting to happen and there needs to be more work done. So in this case, how big is the problem for your perspective, and, and what does your work with the private sector look like? Yeah, I, I wouldn't like to be classified as an unending pessimist, um, <laughs> but you, you, at the start of it, you've got to frame the challenge. Um, Paul's framed it beautifully for tuberculosis. Um, my own background, last uh, 18 or so years, was living in Vietnam, seeing that on a daily basis. And whilst Paul is right that in some countries, XDR, untreatable, untreatable, tuberculosis patients are isolated. The truth is in most parts of the world, untreatable TB, tuberculosis patients are walking around, uh, talking to you, serving you coffee, driving your bus in the morning. That's the truth of it. Uh, it may be that here in Switzerland, those patients would be isolated, but in most of the world, 
they're not. And this should not be framed as an issue only for low-income countries. Um, the truth is that the whole of modern medicine depends on being able to control and treat infections. So perhaps the most exciting area of medicine at the moment, immunotherapies for cancer, that is impossible unless you can control infection. So this is something that has to bind the world together. This is the equivalent, in my view, of medicine, of climate change and the impacts on health. This is not something just that happens in places that I've previously worked in. This is happening here in Davos today. There will be a patient in the hospital today in Davos that has an untreatable or very difficult to treat infection. So that's the challenge. And two years ago, I think we were really not on the starting blocks for how to deal with this. And I pay huge tribute um, to the foundation for running this access um, to antimicrobial agents, and also to some enlightened governments. I think the British and the Dutch government, increasingly the German government, the US, uh, and increasingly, interestingly, India and China are stepping up to the plate and saying, this cannot go on and we need to step up and make a difference here. Um, I came through as an early doctor untreatable HIV, and that is really difficult to manage as a community, as a patient, as a family, and what have you. So that is the challenge we face, and, and we could easily go back into that areas. But two years on from when we were here first, what has happened? Things like this access um, uh, brochure have come out and it sets a benchmark. It sets a benchmark for where industry is. It allows industry to hold itself to account and it allows the public to hold industry to account. Governments have stepped up. The UK government pushed through at the United Nations General Assembly. So the world is now talking about this issue. Wellcome Trust, along with BARDA in the US, established CARBEX to try and encourage and incentivize early uh, push on this. And some governments are starting to think about how incentives can pull through, whether the voucher model that Paul talked about or other incentives. So I think that companies are starting to step up. New entrants are coming into the field. People who were not previously in this space are now trying to look at this space. Companies are sheep-like in some way, Paul, um, and they will go where the opportunity is and where the money is, as will young academics. Young academics will go to areas where they think they've got a career. And if we make this area exciting and successful, then I think new academics will go into that, as I did 30 or so uh, years ago. So I do think there are things to celebrate. We're not there yet. We don't have the new antibiotics that we need. We, we're not good enough yet at preserving the ones we have, and academia has not stepped up to use the ones we have in the best way. But companies are there, governments are there, philanthropy is there, and actually I do feel optimistic that we will be able to turn the tide on this in the next couple of years. Thank you, Jeremy. Julian, uh, we heard high praise. Uh, I think Jeremy used the term enlightened government. I was recently in London to, to visit the Wellcome Trust and, and on the taxi ride from the, from the airport to the Wellcome Trust, I think I heard three times a radio spot saying, don't use antibiotics if you don't need them. But let's, let's hear from you. What else is the EU government, uh, UK government doing to, uh, to work on these issues? Thanks, Georg. And I'm um, delighted to be here representing the British government. And I think, I mean, as Paul said this is a disaster waiting to happen. I think, as Jeremy said, this is like climate change in that the threat really only manifests itself over years and decades. I think the estimate is that by 2050, there'll be 10 million uh, deaths because of antimicrobial resistance unless, unless action is taken, unless action is taken now. And that is the challenge, the political challenge with climate change. It's the political challenge with AMR. The action needs to be taken now by governments today. So. I'm delighted that uh, Sally Davis, our Chief Medical Officer, has made this such a priority for the British government over recent years, working particularly with the Dutch, with the Swedes, with the Germans and with others. And um, we have been putting this on the agenda for the G7, for the G20. Uh, we were very pleased to, not just in the World Health uh, Assembly in terms of an action plan, but also in the UN General Assembly in 2016 to make this an international priority. We've also been putting money behind this. Uh, we've um, put uh, £250 uh, million pounds behind a Fleming Fund, which is allowing us to work with uh, priority countries around the world to tackle how they handle antibiotics, because it comes down to actions taken by, by millions of people, by thousands of organisations, by hundreds of governments, in order to tackle this globally. And working internationally is, is essential to that. But I'm, I think, particularly... Uh, proud to be here today when we're hearing about how 30 major pharmaceutical companies are now engaging, like Johnson Johnson, on this on this AMR benchmark that's been developed by the uh, 
by the Access to Medicines Foundation, which is about how uh, you know, best practice in terms of research and development, in terms of waste management, in terms of marketing, which is an essential part of tackling this. Um, we obviously hope to see more companies joining and engaging with the benchmark, particularly those uh, dealing with animal health, because this is an area where uh, it'll be critical if we're to, to really uh, meet this challenge. And the other critical area that where we as a government want to work with the private sector and want to work through the G7, the G20 in particular, is on this area of developing new antibiotics and how one puts in place the incentives, the regulatory structures that actually encourage companies like Johnson Johnson to put the enormous resources into developing new antibiotics, which is also a critical part of this uh, response to this uh, decades-long challenge. Um, I mean, it's clear that this challenge can't be tackled without the involvement and leadership of the major uh, uh, international companies, the major pharmaceutical companies, and that's why we think today's announcement is so important and so encouraging. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. And uh, just as a reminder for everybody who's, who's watching or is here in, in the room, uh, remember that the Magic Mountain at uh, Davos used to be a place where tuberculosis patients actually came to, to be cured, hopefully by the, by the wonderful Davos Mountain Air. Uh, obviously, we need better treatment than, uh, than that uh, because uh, um, that didn't turn out uh, so well. Tuberculosis is still, is still a massive problem. Jay has been a bit shy. Uh, maybe Jay, uh, show it. The, the the report is available here in copies in the room, but also for all of you on the live stream, it's available on uh, on the website. Um, maybe you want to mention the address for our folks watching. Yes. Um, so the the Access to Medicine Foundation website is uh, uh, www.accesstomedicinefoundation.org, and from that you'll get access to how the industry is doing on on um, tackling the issue of AMR, tackling the issue of access to medicine globally and all our other reports, yeah. so that would be a good link. Thank you very much. And um, Julian, you mentioned already we hope that more companies, more companies join. Jeremy Paul, what's your message to your peers here in Davos, um, both on the public and the private sector? What, what's the most important thing they need to do now? Well, I think we have taken the first initiatives on more collaborative work together on how can we we uh, do it faster by learning from each other but also do uh, uh, do new clinical trial systems and working with the regulators and discussing on how we can how we can move this faster so we can work as an industry we can work on bringing more molecules into development with the regulators in order to accelerate the, the clinical development getting them to patients that's step one so if we need more molecules it have to come out of science through development to regulate to the market and then together with uh, with society the countries in particular will have to work on how do we implement this in a way that it's sustainable both for the country for the first for the molecule that, that for the drug for the new drug but also for the countries and industry on how can we make this sustainable on the long term having many new drugs coming through and making sure that we can treat each and ever uh, each and everything each and each buck in the in society you know? mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that, obviously. I mean, I think the role of philanthropy like ourselves and, and many others um, is w we can act as a neutral space that brings together parts of this community that may not otherwise talk to each other. Um, and there are tensions that exist. We know that. Um, and I think philanthropy has got a critical role in funding the fundamental science and then being a bridge between society and the companies and governments. And I think that's the role we play. Just in my analogy with climate change, what, which I feel very strongly about climate change as well, it's really critical to understand that this is not something that's going to happen to your grandchildren. This is happening now and there's an urgency of today that we need to grasp. I think that would be my message to Paul's peers. And the last bit I'll say is I don't think in this space we have yet galvanized society sufficiently. Um, uh, everybody knows about issues around cancer and oncology and, and rare diseases amongst uh, uh, babies and young children. This doesn't have a societal push at the moment. That was absolutely critical in HIV. It was absolutely critical in other diseases. And we've got to try and work out how we engage society better in order that the push comes from society for this to happen, because ultimately, most politicians do listen to society in some way or other. Mm. And Jeremy, you're in agreement there with our uh, co-chair, Fabiola Giannotti, the, the, the director of CERN, who spoke this morning uh, in the co-chair's press conference to that topic and said, we can't take science for granted and, and 
governments especially need to, to understand that this needs continuous support and they need to step up the work. And I think, Julian, uh, your government is, is leading by example here, um, and, and that is great to, th to see. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. Let's see a show of hands if we have any questions in the room. If you could give us an indication. We have a microphone here. I know the first question is always uh, it's the most difficult one. Don't be shy. You picked journalism as a profession. You shouldn't be shy. <laughs> well, it looks like you've answered all the questions to everybody's uh, happiness. Um, so thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for speaking to this important topic today. And as I said, there's, there's copies of the report. And uh, please visit the website. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.